This is one of the things we love most about this day, the spirit of reunion among old friends and the new friendships that bloom here. I have no doubt you will continue to reconnect with each other throughout the day. Before we begin this awards presentation, I'd like to take a few moments to recognize my colleagues who serve on the Alumni Council, the leadership board of your Alumni Association. You'll find a list of our members as well as information about how to get involved with the Alumni Council in your program. I'd like to acknowledge all of the council members who are here serving as alumni ambassadors on campus today. To identify us, they're all wearing yellow Alumni Council ribbons on their name tags, so I encourage you to seek us out if you're interested in learning more about how to stay engaged with the college. The council has several committees that work closely with the Office of Alumni Relations to actively reconnect alumni to Teachers College. I would like to especially recognize our Distinguished um, Alumni and Early Career Awards Committee, chaired by Marion Boltby and Fran Reamer, for their work that brings us all here today. This committee has the difficult task of reviewing nominations and selecting the award recipients we honor each year. This is a role that we take very seriously, and as you can see, they have done an exceptional job this year. We encourage you all to think about the extraordinary TC alumni you know who are making a difference in their fields. We hope you will submit a nomination in their name for our consideration for next year's academic festival. It's never too early to plan. Um, you will find the form at our resource table in the Everett Lounge as well as online. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce another of our distinguished alumna, uh, President Furman, who knows all too well what it takes to achieve this award who will now add her congratulations. The Alumni Council has done a terrific job making this weekend successful. And Jeffrey, I'd like to thank you and recognize your leadership, your two-year term as president. will be coming to a close in May, so we're so grateful for your service to our alumni and your peers. And our president-elect, Marion Bulby. Where is she? Where's Marion? There she is will have big shoes to fill. So uh, my notes say that Academic Festival is one of my favorite events at TC. So it is, and that, that's why they're in the notes, but I have to, I do cheat a little because I also say that it's scholarship luncheon. So that's also a favorite event to honor uh, people who have donated to um, scholarship, which is our most important priority. But, but it is true that I absolutely love this event because we get to see the innovative work of alumni, faculty, and students who are changing the world and to salute our alumni for their accomplishments. They're the best ambassadors for TC and they speak for our work and, and we're all so proud of you. We're also very happy to see that engagement with alumni is growing in so many exciting directions. With regional groups, I think there are 45, is that right, Rizzo? 45 regional groups, which is fantastic. Uh, international alumni networks, of course the Alumni Council and our 21st century leaders. We've enhanced our social media activities and continue to develop online webinars for virtual programming. Um, we worked very hard to make sure that all our alumni, wherever they are, can engage. And so we're urging you to stay connected through alumni relations where you can share your suggestions as well as your news and accomplishments. This year's academic festival, Making a World of Difference, highlights so many terrific alumni, faculty, and students and um, we're delighted to have such a wonderful program that people are having trouble choosing. I've already run into people who split their time between two sessions, so. I know that it's a difficult choice to make when there's all these wonderful things to um, see. So, so much of what we do is supported through uh, the generous support of donors and alumni. Um, our historic where the Future Comes First campaign is helping us to provide our students with the resources and programs they need as they continue their phenomenal research and social justice work. Thanks to generous friends and alumni, the campaign has reached $285 million of our $300 million goal. Applause. Um, 
Student scholarships and fellowships remain our number one priority. It's the campaign that's going, helping them realize their dreams of making a difference in the world. We've established more than 150 scholarships since the campaign began, but we would love to do more. So you will see people walking around with ask me how I can support a student. Please ask them. Um, I was thrilled this morning to present the President's Medal of Excellence to two women changing lives and developing future leaders. Lady Gaga's mom, Cynthia Bisset Germanata, is doing so much to affect the lives of youth and foster a braver uh, world. And I'm so pleased that our other medalist, Phyllis Kossoff, was able to stay and join us for lunch. And she's over there with her family. Phyllis has truly enriched the TC community with her continuing support and engagement. Please join us later when TC's International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution presents the Morton Deutsch Award for Social Justice to Daryl Wing Su, TC Professor of Psychology and Education, and Hodia Shirazi, a TC Master's Candidate named a Global Champion for Women's Economic Empowerment by the UN Women's Empowerment, Empower Women team. It will be my honor to open the session with a few remarks honoring the legendary Morton Deutsch, a uh, TC great who we lost, lost last month at the age of 97. Now it's time to celebrate our 2017 Distinguished Alumni. This award has been given for over 40 years. Honorees are chosen by a discerning and tough jury, their fellow alumni. And today, uh, you will honor six stellar individuals. They span the globe, represent a diverse range of expertise and perspectives. And uh, you're going to learn much more about them from the, the presenters and then um, also from the chance they will have to say a few brief remarks. So congratulations to our honorees. You embody the best of TC and make us all very proud. I'll now turn the program back to Jeffrey for the official honors. Joining me in recognizing our distinguished alumni today are members of TC's faculty and administration. They will read from the citations that are being presented to each honoree. I'd like to first introduce and welcome Ernest Morrill, Macy Professor of Education and Director of TC's Institute for Urban and Minority Education to make our first presentation. Pam Allen, you have fought to make literacy a fundamental right for people around the world, declaring that reading is like breathing in and writing like breathing out and storytelling is the link between them. In the United States, your team has worked in Detroit, where just 9% of students in the eighth grade read at level, and Jackson, Mississippi, which faces a $256 million education deficit. Lit World, your global nonprofit, has acted as a literacy first responder in Jordan's Atari camp for Syrian refugees, in Kibera, Kenya, where hundreds of thousands of children live in dire conditions, and in Kathmandu, Nepal, where communities have been torn by natural disaster. Through your Her Story campaign, you've empowered girls and young women to be mentors in their communities, listen to other stories, and share their own. This year alone, Her Story has launched in 10 countries, including Afghanistan, Liberia, Nepal, and Sierra Leone, where communities are grappling with violent conflict, natural disasters, and health epidemics. And you've reached a vast audience of professionals and parents alike through your 26 books, including Every Child a Super Reader, Seven Strengths to Open a World of Possible, on which I am very proud to have served as your co-author. Above all, you spark teachers to elevate their profession and their lives of their students. You have recounted the strategy suggested to you by a boy who wanted his test-obsessed school to schedule more of your read-aloud sessions. His advice make the read aloud seem like a birthday celebration. From that spark came World Read Aloud Day, celebrated now in more than 100 countries. Pam Allen, in our book together, we declared our aspiration to make all children flashlight in bed readers who are confident, who understand the demands of the text, who read voluminously, and even read in more than one language. Clearly, there are miles of travel before we attain that goal, but we would not have come so far without your love of the written word. 
and your inspired and inspiring efforts to show us the way forward. For these remarkable contributions, Teachers College proudly presents you with its Distinguished Alumni Award. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ernest. And thank you, everybody, so much for, for being here. This is a very big honor for me. I love Teachers College so much. I want to just, I'm going to briefly speak to you about three kinds of calls. The first was a phone call I made in January 1986. I was teaching second grade at a storefront school, falling in love with the kids and the work and the life of a teacher. But mostly, I was falling in love with the kids. At the same time, I was taking sign language classes at Gallaudet University and immersing myself in this new idea that the beauty of language belongs to everyone. Everyone. And through my introduction to people living at that time on the margins of English language, but making a true home for themselves in a language that fully belonged to them, I wanted to be part of this journey. I wanted to understand more. So I made a phone call, and it was to Teachers College from a payphone outside that storefront school. And when I made the call, I said, I'd like to speak to the Department of Deaf Education. And then I was put through to a man who answered the phone, who's here today, Professor Bob Kretschmer. He answered the phone. He's right here. He answered the phone, and I explained my passion. And he said, please come meet with me tomorrow in New York City. And I said, OK. So I got on the train, I went to meet him, and there he offered me a two-year full scholarship to Teachers College. He changed my life in that moment. He answered my call. The second is about a calling and what it means to have one and where it comes from. Some might think people are born with a calling, but I don't think so. I think a calling is really about listening. It's about listening to, out of the millions of voices that come your way, some might be calling more urgently. And that calling is how you're made. Everybody has a right to callings. One person is not more privileged to a calling than anyone else. It's that we get lucky when people listen, when people pick up the phone, when people really hear us. Many people have made my calling. My father taught me how to listen. It was his greatest strength. He would have loved to be here today. He would have loved it. My mother made my calling. Her voice reading to me brought me the love of reading and books and what reading does to transform a life, especially the life of a very shy child, which is what I was. My grandmothers made my calling. Both were teachers and one my mother's mother taught here at Teachers College. My father's mother got her second grade teaching license after raising four kids. And when she grew old and could not remember the stories, many of her second grade students paid tribute to her and told her the story of her own life she could no longer tell. All these people have called me to this work. My learning called me. All I read and read at Amherst College to the moment I arrived here at Teachers College, I found my intellectual center. I read passionately devouring what it seemed like it was meant for me to read. I was called by the greatest thinkers of our time, Maxine Green, professor, thinker, philosopher, who turned my mind on here to the pedagogy, the exhilarating pedagogy of child-centered learning. John Dewey, Paolo Freire, Don Graves, and more. I still remember the moment in class, the very moment when Maxine said, Read the word, read the world. That's what Paolo Freire said, and that's what we're going to do together. And I knew what I had to do. Lucy Calkins, who gave me the pathway to see, it was story I wanted. Stories in books, stories in children's hearts that set me on the course that would change my life. The calling that made me came from all these teachers who taught me how to think, taught me how to learn, how to see teaching as a way of listening as a platform for social justice, as a dignified professional journey, 
although the world and certainly our media does not always see it that way. My calling was made by the children I have taught, by the boys of Children's Village, by the children at St. Francis de Sales School for the Deaf, by a great teacher who's also here today, Maria Hartman. I watched every move you made, every single move, showing the power of great mentorship and the importance of professional learning. I just copied everything she did. And she's right there, Maria. I was made this way by my husband, Jim, who accompanied me on all my field trips we took our kids on, to see the beach for the first time on city buses all over the city. My kids recently said, didn't you need like a permit or a pass for that? We didn't need anything. We just got on the bus and went. He was there with me because we wanted our kids from Guyana and Haiti, deaf children in New York for the first time to see the world of the city. I was made by the children we serve at Lit World, from Pakistan to the Philippines to Kenya to Detroit to Mississippi to Harlem. I was made by watching that they taught us, they teach us the greatest joy is the book you love to read, is the book that could save your life. I was made by our Lit World board, by all my Lit Vision friends who came to me together around a dining room table and said, what can we do to help? I was made by my own children into a better teacher than I could imagine. Being without them, a, war, a person, a mother, they're my greatest gift by being present to their journeys as inspiring young women their abundant and generous spirits, their open hearts and endlessly fascinating minds. I am a learner who accompanies them. They called me to the work from their first breaths. A calling is made, not born. I was called to the work of teaching and learning, and it's my joy and honor that I did it here at Teachers College. I want to thank President Furman for what you've done to lead this college into the 21st century so brilliantly. You make literacy, which is humankind's greatest innovation, still humankind's greatest innovation. And so, in this last minute, this brings me to my final call, and that is a call to action. All across this country and around the world, children are waiting to learn to read, to write, to tell the stories of their lives, to help us author a great democracy in a brave new world, to rise from the ashes of poverty and war and hunger, to tell a new story. Education is the one thing that makes this possible. It's the one fully equalizing lever of our human society. If you have it, you have power. If you can read, you can write. If you can write, you can tell the story you want to be told. You can author your life. My calls to action are this. Find a way to accompany children in mind, heart, and spirit to the place where education and opportunity meet, for this is a place of great joy. Find a way to speak up for children, both here and around the world. Don't stay silent. We cannot let it happen that budgets get cut for books and teacher training and technology because we want to build up our military. This is not OK. This is not OK. The greatest investment we can make in national security is in our children, our schools, and our teachers. That is the best national security investment we can make. Finally, find new ways to listen to young people. I begin and end today with the subject of a call, phone calls. Every Sunday, my father liked nothing better than to make and get phone calls. Every Sunday, he'd take out a yellow legal pad and go through a list of relatives and friends, and he'd check them all off, and it took him all day. And what he did was he listened. He sat on the phone and asked a few questions. How's it going? What are you thinking? What has happened this week that surprised you or changed you? What a great teacher he was for me, for my daughters, for my husband, for all of us. Please find a way to do that for young and old alike. I want to thank my husband, Jim, for without him, none of these blessings would be here for me. He is my kindred spirit and gender equal partner in raising our children and building our work together. I'm so proud to be here in the company of my fellow honorees and all and the teachers to be, the teachers I've had 
the teachers I love, President Furman, for what you do. I'm proud to be an alumni of Teachers College. Thank you for bringing us to this moment together. I am honored to be here. Thank you. I'd like to invite to the stage uh, Noah Dresner, Associate Professor and Director of the Higher and Post-Secondary Education Program. Arthur Chickering, unlike you, we were wholly unsurprised to learn that there is a website called Arthur Chickering Saved My Life. No one has done more than you to ensure that college experience leads to, in your words, a level of self-understanding, self-agency, and self-determination that will enable graduates to take charge of their careers and their lives. Your 1969 book, Education and Identity, broke new ground by approaching the college years as a true developmental phase with all the complexity that it implies. At a moment when college campuses were becoming, as never before, a national crucible for political upheaval and personal exploration, you provided a working Bible for student affairs administrators everywhere, essential for shaping, essential for shaping policies and programs that responded to students' needs. In your 2014 memoir, Cool Passions, you explain that your insight into the turbulent inner lives of students and your willingness to challenge uh, the received wisdom of an entire field re reflected a powerful anti-authoritarian streak that emerged during your own early years and continues to shape your thinking today. Yet as its title suggests, Cool Passions stands as an important postscript to the 60s and 70s, reminding us, in essence, that the one thing to fight, it's one thing to fight a revolution, it's quite another to win it. Or as you put in a recent, or as you put it in a recent interview, unbridled passion, unbridled passion never really serves us well in our life or in our work. We need to maintain a steady fire in addressing issues, especially especially in facing slings and arrows from the establishment. As I mentioned earlier, you're before your time. Arthur Chickering, our nation is once again caught up in contentious debate over its most fundamental institutions, rights, and principles. At such a time, your work feels more relevant than ever. For your brilliant insight in recognizing college as a life stage, for, enduring, for an enduring framework you have given colleges as a means for encouraging students to grapple with their inner selves and the outer world, and for inspiring us to challenge accepted wisdom and change the world around us, we proudly present you with a Teachers College Distinguished Alumni Award. Well, thank you for that uh, fine tribute, Noah. And thank you, Teachers College, for recognizing uh, my career. <coughs> I'm uh, sorry that Gertrude Driscoll, my advisor, is not here to share this celebration. Far and away, she was the, the most important person during my graduate studies here. She offered emotional support for my shaky self-confidence. She offered wise advice that helped set the cornerstone for my career. And she provided practical assistance. Soon after, <clears throat> my wife and I and our infant son moved into what was then Saratoga Hall 
a graduate student apartments on 122nd Street, she told me that <coughs> she had obtained an Eleanor Colford Morris Fellowship for me of $450. My wife and I, while uh, I was, both of us were working, had managed to save $3,000 for our year of required residency. So that was a very welcome 15% augmentation to our resources. <laughs> We still ate lots of meatloaf and <laughs> peanut butter sandwiches, but that was a great help. Uh, <clears throat> she also, when she learned about my interest in the impact of various educational policies and practices and teaching practices on students, suggested that I might uh, think about pursuing a career in educational leadership and administration instead of school psychology. Any of us who have hung around <coughs> higher education very much will realize how rare it is for a professor or a department head to suggest to one of their students that they study something else. <clears throat> uh, following that, after I completed my residency, she recommended me to Verda Wentling, who was Director of Psychological Services at the Woodmere Hewlett School District out in Long Island. This was an upper middle class school district with a highly competitive school culture. Any student who wasn't admitted to the best colleges, was dumb and inadequate. And instead of the dominant practice of school psychology at that time, which was to do diagnostic workups and uh, see students in psychotherapy, she had a community preventive mental health approach to our work. So we met regularly with the uh, school superintendent, with school principals, and with teachers who were having problems with students, and more importantly, with teachers who were making problems for students, damaging their self-esteem and mental health. So those three years working with Verda in that school system really reinforced and broadened and complexified my concern about the interactions between educational policies and practices and their impact on student learning and development. So when, uh, by chance, I was invited to create and direct a teacher education program at Monmouth College in Long Branch, New Jersey, then just trying to become a four-year institution after having been a two-year college. I jumped at the chance. And when President Schaefer interviewed me, he said, I want to have the best teacher's college in New Jersey, teacher education program in New Jersey. And I said, fine. So my wife and our then three children moved over uh, <clears throat> to Long Branch. And during the first semester, as uh, I created an advisory board, uh, local school administrators and some lead teachers, so that I could arrange to have students as part of every course they took be in the schools in some kind of capacity and link that experiential learning to their coursework. Uh, in January, Schaefer called me into his office. He had a strong temper and with a red face, he cursed me out for creating that advisory board. Uh, 
saying, how am I going to build the dormitories I need if you're not generating the revenue from le large lecture classes that I need to carry this place forward? So I said, well, that's not what I understood you wanted me to be, to do here. So he fired me. Uh, <coughs> at that time, the agreement with the American Association of University Professors was such that you needed to receive a notification of termination no later than February 1st. And my letter was dated February 2nd. <laughs> <laughs> so I got help from AUP and hired a lawyer and uh, sued uh, the president and the institution, and I'm happy to say that the following fall, he became president emeritus. <laughs> but the best thing that happened was that the biology, the head of the biology department, Bob Silva, had learned about my devotion to progressive education. After I graduated, with a degree in comparative literature, I got an MAT degree from Harvard. And uh, I was uh, uh, ready. I had applied to the University of Wisconsin for a PhD in comparative literature, which I'd majored in. And the only course that had had any impact on me at Harvard Graduate School of Education was Robert Ulich's Educational Philosophy course, which introduced me to Dewey. And uh, my friend at uh, Mama told me about this little college in Vermont called Goddard College, which was based on progressive education principles. Tim Pitkin, the creator and president, had studied here with Dewey. And I had Kilpatrick on his board, and my wife and I loved to ski and hike in Vermont and had had enough of the New York metropolitan area. So we went to Goddard. And Goddard's desired educational outcomes, those seven educational outcomes, became the conceptual basis for the six years of research I did to evaluate an experiment in college curriculum organization. Uh, <clears throat> so education and identity, which has turned out to make a useful contribution, was anchored in the six years of evaluative research I did at Goddard. But Gertrude Driscoll, and my educationally powerful experiences here at TC really set the cornerstone for all that work. And so I thank this institution and <coughs> my advisor and professors for having uh, put me on this path. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage Karen Block, Professor of Psychology and Education. Madeline Heilman, workplace discrimination against women is evident as is climate change. Yet, as in the latter field, science is essential to refute the deniers, convince the skeptics, and educate us all. For the past 40 years, you have done precisely that, asking, what preconceptions do even the most enlightened people hold? What conditions trigger biased reactions? How does bias play out? Building on the social justice framework of your TC mentor, the late Morton Deutsch, you have powerfully shaped the field of gender studies with your answers, raising the bar in social science research with studies that have brilliantly replicated real world workplace situations. Above all, you have demonstrated that inequity stems from stereotypes of women that are prescriptive as well as descriptive, dictating norms of behavior. Early on, for example, you showed that a woman's performance is more often devalued because of gender 
resulting in fewer opportunities to advance careers. A man's success is credited to ability, you found, while successful women are recognized for effort or judge the beneficiaries of luck or easy assignments. You have demonstrated that occupational sex bias often occurs because of lack of fit between expected female behaviors such as altruism and team play and a given role's supposed requirements. Women themselves share these expectations. In a paper marvelously titled, It Had to Be You, Not Me, you documented the negative performance expectations that lead women themselves to excessively credit male teammates and shortchange themselves or female colleagues. These findings have broad real world applications. The lack of fit model is central to all of the unconscious bias training used by corporate diversity officers. A brief that you co-offered was pivotal in a high profile United States Supreme Court case on employer sex discrimination. You are an annual presence at Google's yearly PyLab Summit and you share your work and mentor young scholars from around the world. Madeline Heilman, for your brilliant and nuanced research into gender bias, for bringing some of the most contested and controversial questions of our time into the realm of science, and above all, for making visible the invisible barriers that women face. Teachers College proudly presents you with its Distinguished Alumni Award. It's very sweet to receive this kind of honor from the institution that set me off from where I began. So thank you very much for that. And it's especially sweet to be introduced by one of my favorite and most accomplished students, Karen Block. Thank you, Karen. There it is. <laughs> On the other hand, being here today is, is very bittersweet for me. Um, as Susan has mentioned, my mentor, Morten Deutsch, to whom I'm indebted in so many ways, both for the knowledge that he imparted and the life lessons that he taught me, passed away a few weeks ago. And I credit Mort not only with teaching me to be a good researcher, but also with teaching me to be a courageous one someone who pursues ideas, even if they're unpopular, which incidentally, when I started my career, studying gender was pretty unpopular. In fact, I was told by a senior colleague when I was at Yale at the time that it would be the kiss of death for my career to study gender. Um, but Mort always encouraged me to study what I wanted to study, to study what, you know, what I had a passion about as long as I did it well, and as long as I did rigorous research. He would have been immensely proud to be here today, and I, I really I miss him terribly. In any event, one doesn't pursue a career alone, and I want to acknowledge that. I have my cheering section over here. Uh, and I want to thank my family, um, my daughter, Jessica and granddaughter Hannah, who've always been an inspiration and a source of support. My daughter Erica, who couldn't be here today, she's out in California doing a postdoc, whose steadiness and kindness and intelligence and caring has helped me through many, many a difficult moment. My daughter Allison, right over there, who has challenged my thinking since she was able to talk. I mean, literally, since she was able to talk. And it's been a sounding board for so many of my ideas throughout my career, making me a better teacher, a better scholar, and a better person. And my granddaughter, Serena, who shows every sign of following in her mother's footsteps and being equally challenging, <laughs> equally rewarding, and equally loving. Finally, I want to thank Harvey Hornstein, who has always been incredibly supportive of me and of my career. First, as my professor here at TC. And he was pretty tough on me, I want you to know. <laughs> 
and later as my husband and my best friend. No one could have been a better life partner. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you, TC. Please welcome Bill Baldwin, Professor of Practice and Chair of the Department of Organization and Leadership. Jian Mingxu, the complex challenge of education reform demands the work of multiple disciplines and perspectives. You have brilliantly modeled that approach, both as a gifted leader and administrator, and through the astounding breadth of your own scholarship which spans school finance, education policy and analysis, psychology and education, and indigenous education. Indeed, your resume suggests a cross-disciplinary institute, undergraduate literature major, advanced mindfulness meditation practitioner, co-author of a landmark text on school finance and school-based management, editor of Contemporary Educational Research Quarterly, an editorial board member of the Journal of Education and Psychology, author on topics ranging from school incentive programming in South Carolina to mathematics performance in rural Taiwan. In short, clearly a Renaissance man is leading Taiwan's education renaissance. As president of Taiwan's National Academy for Educational Research, you are crafting long-term policies to guide future textbook development, curriculum and instruction, testing and assessment, teacher professional development, and all other aspects of the education system. You are also modeling a commitment to educational equity and closing the gap between the highest and lowest achieving students. For as you have repeatedly warned, although East Asian countries achieve stellar aggregate performance on global assessments, the performance variations between and within their schools are more pronounced than in other countries with low income and minority students lagging behind. In your words, this gap is not just unfortunate for those lucky, unlucky enough to be born to the wrong parents, but represents a huge and growing waste of potential. You have championed the most comprehensive approach to closing that gap, sounding an urgent call for investment in social programs that support the well-being of students, families, and communities. Meanwhile, you have served as Teachers College's ambassador to Taiwan, identifying and connecting with alumni there, and even holding several events for TC that have fostered institutional collaborations. Tian Ming Chu, for your brilliant scholarship and educational leadership that emphasizes not only individual and national success in a highly competitive world, but also the development of all students into well-rounded human beings Teachers College proudly presents you with its Distinguished Alumni Award. Receiving Distinguished Alumni Award from Teachers College is not only a great personal honor for me, but it also has a special meaning for Taiwan's education. Since the beginning of the 20th century, Chinese students started studying at TC. In 1914, Guo Bingwen, the first Chinese student, received his PhD degree from TC. Fifteen years later, Lin Maosheng, the first Taiwanese student, earned his doctorate here. Dr. Lin was also the first Taiwanese ever to receive a doctorate degree in the US. Then, before the 1960s, a total of 147 Chinese and Taiwanese students received doctorate degree in education across the US. And 68 of them, nearly half, graduated from TC. During that same 60 years in Germany, only nine Chinese and Taiwanese students received doctor degree in education. If not for its outstanding faculty administration, 
and the quality of education, I cannot imagine how any institution could possibly attract so many fine students. More importantly, most of these TC graduates returned to China and Taiwan and undertook the fundamental work of modernizing the education, educational system. For example, the 633 school system, six years of elementary school, three years of junior high, and three years of senior high school, which still dominate in China and Taiwan today, was a result of the collab collaboration in 1922 of TC graduate and educational master, including Paul Monroe, Edward Thong Dyke, William Kilpatrick, and Zhang Dewey. The huge impact of TC graduates on China and Taiwan cover all aspects of education, from the educational system to the curriculum and instructions, as exemplified in the contribution of Minister of Education Jiang Menglin and Premier Li Huan. From primary and secondary school to higher education, as seen in the contribution of Guo Bingwen, Lin Maosheng, and Li Zheng, and from formal education to experimental education, as shown in the works of Tao Xingzi and Chen Heqin, those are graduate from TC. Moreover, Zhang, Ping, Zhang Peng Chun, a 1922 graduate, was the vice chairman of the Commission on Human Rights in the United Nations, which drew up the Declaration of Human Rights, a document with worldwide influence. This year, the theme of academic festival is making a world of difference. Teachers College fully deserve its reputation for it truly has have made a big difference for China and Taiwan. As an alumni of TC, it seems imperative to mention Zhang Dui. He visited China and stayed there from 1919 to 1921 a time when the country was in a very turbulent state. Owing to his personal charm, he managed to influence this country with his philosophy of pragmatism and his experience of democracy as a form of government as well as a way of life. After 1949, the People's Republic of China turned its back on the West and Dewey's influence dwindled. However, his thinking in general and philosophy of education in particular have never been out of fashion in Taiwan, a democratic country where I come from. Taiwan is the only Chinese society that has really put Dewey's idea into practice. For this, we should really pay tribute to Zhang Dewey. Currently, I'm the president of the National Academy of Education Research in Taiwan. As the think tank for Taiwan's Ministry of Education, NAER is responsible for developing the national curriculum framework, training school leaders, assessing students' performance at all level, improving the education quality of the disadvantaged, and make policy recommendation to the Ministry of Education. As the president of NAER and a TC graduate. I wish to continue TC glorious tradition of making a world of difference, which include making a difference in Taiwan's education. And I hope to fulfill President Furman's expectation for TC to promote our social justice mission in such a way that education becomes the solution. Finally, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Teachers College, to National Taiwan Normal University, and to my advisor and mentor, Professor Craig Richards. I would also like to thank my parents, wife, and daughter. Their loving support and faithful companionship have made possible my wonderful life. Thank you.
Please welcome to the stage Tom Rock, Vice Provost for Student Affairs, who will introduce our first Early Career Award. David Flink, conventional wisdom holds that if at first you do not succeed, try and try again. But ever since your third grade teacher chastised you for not trying enough, you have shown that success is often about working smarter, not harder. Struggling in school before being diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD, you spent more time in the hallway than the classroom, banished for unruly behavior. You were saved by a janitor who played chess with you and by your facility for magic tricks, which gave you confidence. These were your first steps toward understanding who you are and developing the insights you have shared widely. That LD means learning difference, not learning disorder. And it, mm -hmm. and it signifies membership in a valuable and important minority. And that LD children must focus on how they can learn rather than on why they cannot. That journey has taken you to prominence as a visionary who imagines a world where all learners will be recognized and empowered to succeed, and as a leader on the front lines of the emergent learning rights movement. With Eye to Eye, the nonprofit you co-founded at Brown University, you hit on the inspired notion of recruiting LD college students to help LD youngsters develop critical social and emotional skills, understand their own learning styles, and learn to ask for help. You have since developed Young Leaders Organizing Institutes to train young people to lead grassroots campaigns and advocate for their rights as learners. You have added a scientific base to your knowledge of LD issues through your graduate work here at Teachers College. And you have published Thinking Differently, a guide for parents of children with learning disabilities. Though obviously written for LD children and their families, Thinking Differently, as mental health expert Harold Kopowitz writes, helps all of us to understand LD children. David Flink for persevering to harness your own difference as an asset, for courageously sharing your story, and for ensuring happier, more productive lives for countless others, we proudly present you with the Teachers College Early Career Award. So I'm struck by an early career award, because I feel like it's both an honor and a challenge. Uh, I'm truly, truly honored. Uh, and thank you. And thank you for those really generous words. Uh, the challenge, I realize, is it kind of says, you're not done. <laughs> you're early, but you got a long way to go. And, um, and I accept the challenge. Uh, I've been thinking today a lot both about the call for young people and how we must invest in young people because uh, they're going to change our world. They're our democracy. They're our future. And also uh, thinking about really who influenced me here at TC and then hearing names that sound familiar and how many of those people aren't with us anymore. So uh, for me, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge Maxine Green, the late Maxine Green. Um, I'm going to say a, a, a few words about her and uh, then explain how this challenge you all have given me, uh, I'm trying to make into action. Uh, I easily could have called my first book like Lunches with Maxine. Uh, and the reason why that was is when I came to Teachers College, uh, she was a legend, right? And someone like me, someone who spent most of his time on the cold linoleum floors outside a classroom doesn't get to spend time with Maxine. That, it doesn't get to call her Maxine, by the way, right? And um, you know, you took a risk on me accepting me here, but that still didn't, for me, feel like a reason to get to spend time with Maxine. But I think through Tom's encouragement, actually, he said, just write her. And so I, I shot her an email, and I said, can we get some time together? And she invited me to her apartment for lunch. <laughs> for lunch. She was going to feed me. 
not just my mind, my soul, and my stomach. Uh, and that became uh, a weekly occurrence for two years. Uh, some of that was actually credit that I received here, and which I appreciate. That was really good learning. And it later became intellectual sparring. And it became clear just by the nature of decades between us that she was saying to me directly, I'm not going to be here forever, but life is long. And your job is first to continue this work, and second, to ensure that others follow you. And so much of her work, as many of you know, is around democracy. Um, we run an art-based mentoring program, so it was also around how art can be the truest expression of democracy at times, help us find our voice. And I just want to speak to that, because I think, President Furman, you have absolutely led us in that. And while we didn't get to spend time together while I was here, your influence has affected me. Um, and so now I want to express how that challenge that was started here in 2007, and it's continued now, I graduated in 2008, but you know, for the past decade or so, uh, seems to be acting. Uh, in the real world. Because what we do here is we think, right? I spent a lot of time thinking with really smart people. But then if I didn't take that out into the real world and make it a thing, that was just for me, right? So as I left here, uh, my time was, as Tom described, uh, really thinking about mentoring as a one-to-one -one experience. Uh, a person who had a learning challenge, uh, dyslexia, ADHD, whatever words you like to describe it, empowering uh, a middle school kid who had the same learning experience. We're doing that work around the country and around the world, but it hadn't occurred to me that that might be actually actions in democracy. Uh, while I was actually here at TC, uh, I received a phone call from one of our students who was doing this mentoring uh, for a challenge for me. Uh, his name's Jeremy. Uh, he was uh, doing this weekly work, and he, he called me up and he said, you know, they're reauthorizing uh, ESEA, right? And do you know that one of the things that they're planning on doing is having students who have learning disabilities not get tested. And that, for me, expresses as they don't matter. And you're telling me all the time that you know, we matter. And you're telling me that Maxine tells you to tell me that we matter. Um, and by the way, you're not doing this work anymore. I am. So I need you to be my chaperone. I said, what? He says, well, we're going to DC. And you're not the person who needs to tell this story. We are. So I need you to set up these meetings and be the chaperone. And we're going to talk to our politicians about how we deserve to be seen, heard, and valued. And then he hung up the phone. <laughs> oh, college students. Um, <laughs> and it was like striking to me how quickly I went from an 18-year-old doing this work to now a mid-20-year-old who became the chaperone. And by the way, fast forward now, I was like a single young man in New York, and now I am uh, the father of an amazing little girl, Emma, for whom I fight every day to make sure that our education system is equitable, right? So I became chaperone, right? And I set up a bunch of meetings uh, down in Washington, DC, and I bring Jeremy and a handful of other young people who wear their learning difference with pride, the one in five people in America who wear their learning difference with pride. And I sat in a bunch of these meetings, and I said nothing, because it was the student's turn to speak. And at this last meeting, it was with the um, head of the Education Committee, Senator Bennett. And um, all the students sort of came prepared. They were dressed in suits and ready to grow. Jeremy had prepared his story for sure, but nothing else. Uh, for, you know, forgot his tie, popped his collar, thought that would like compensate for the situation. Uh, forgot his belt, untucked his shirt to like cover up that situation. Uh, I'm thinking, this is the guy who's going to deliver the message. Ooh. But uh, we get to Jeremy, and he looks at the senator, and he just says, Senator Bennett. I want you to know that I'm dyslexic, and I am proud of my gifts and my flaws. And like literally, that's all he says. And like literally, if this had been like a concert, he would have just like dropped the mic, you know? That was kind of the way that he had about it. Like, I deserve to be seen, drop the mic. The senator raises his right hand, and he says, Jeremy, I just want you to know this US senator is also dyslexic and proud of his gifts and his flaws. I'm like, oh my god, we found the dyslexic senator. <laughs> Like, how do we not know this? He had never talked about it publicly. And this is what young people can do. So I went from chaperone to like, you know, cheerleader. I'm like marching around, like saluting the flag. Uh, and I realized I've left out the guy who set up this whole thing, Jonathan Davidson. And I'm like, oh, no, no, we need our allies too. I like try and backtrack thanking him for setting up the whole meeting. And 
um, you know, we have dyslexics and non-dyslexics and we need our non-dyslexics. And he says, no, 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 you didn't leave me out. I'm dyslexic too. Senator turns to him and says, you are? Like the two of them had been sending each other memos for years. Like no one was reading them, you know? <laughs> and um, I thought about sharing the story today because this is what we're about. Our job is to inspire young people to figure out their passion, to make it a reality, and to create change. That is what was done for me when I was here at TC, and I have continued to take that challenge and put it in the hands of the next generation of young people. It's for my daughter Emma, it's for our kids, and it's for our society. So I am deeply humbled and accept the challenge and look forward to be coming back to TC many times, updating you on how we're doing. Thank you. Please welcome Britt Hamring, lecturer in the Inclusive Education Programs, who will introduce our second Early Career Award. Leticia Lyle, you are an emerging international leader in the field of social and emotional learning, CEL, which helps young students work collaboratively by developing their ability to recognize and manage their feelings, act with concern for others, and confidently face challenges. You passionately believe CELL is a powerful tool to enhance creativity, yet recognize that passion alone cannot win converts to the development of so-called soft skills. Teachers, you have noted, are scientists. And quote, one can't simply tell them collaboration is good for the soul. One must have evidence. To that end, you serve as the Director of Curriculum and Teacher Development at Somos Educación. Is it Casio, Brazil's largest basic education company. You founded Mindset Education, a consulting group that brings 21st century education to the core of institutions. And after school, Educatio, a project and competency-based after school program and preschool. And you serve as postgraduate studies course coordinator at Institucio Singularares, a Brazilian university that develops new models to prepare teachers for a complex world. The Lehman Foundation has recognized these contributions by awarding you a prestigious fellowship. Yet now you are taking your efforts to a new level. Two years ago, you developed the Compasio Socioemotional Curriculum, a nationwide cell curriculum for public schools. Another nonprofit you created, Institucio Villa Educacio, is, the leading is, is leading the curriculum's adaptation and implementation. And you also spearheaded design of an important matrix that assesses cell competencies within STEAM programs for high school students. At Teachers College, you have generously shared your expertise with our community, fostering a strong, and growing network of Brazilian alumni and creating opportunities for other Brazilians to attend the college. Leticia Lyle, for applying and championing a set of tools that amplify the power of education from within the learner, for serving as an ambassador between and among education systems around the world, and above all, for working tirelessly to enable all students to realize their potential we proudly present you with the Teachers College Early Career Award. I, when I got here today, I was surprised to see Britt. Britt was not only my course coordinator, but she's one of the most inspiring teachers I've ever met. She not only supported me, my whole program, but she really taught me what a teacher should do, which is to give voice to those ones who have not been representative. And, and she did that every day for two years with her heart and soul. And I couldn't imagine a bigger honor than receiving this from you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 
Um, well, when I was a kid, I always dreamed of getting an Oscar. That was, you know, my re rehearsed the speeches, and you know, I dressed up for one. Uh, <laughs> and it's true. Um, but this is a lot better than getting an Oscar. I, I have to tell you. Um, although my official career as a teacher started when I joined TC in 2009. I was always an educator at heart. I had the privilege of coming from a family where education was seen as a social justice tool, as a centerpiece for what we all should be doing. And, and it was very valued. Um, but it was at TC that I was able to bring that into the center of my life. Um, TC taught me the art of being an elementary school teacher. Uh, I think we talk a lot about our master teachers and we all remember our, one of our elementary school teachers and there is a lot of hard work behind it. I was expected to practice with truth and purpose with a lot of hard work, with a lot of preparation. Uh, those were tough couple years, but they were one of the most enriching times of my life. I taught reading, writing, science, and of all things, for those who know me, I even taught fractions. I reconciled with the math I had forgotten, um, and I was able to meet and be a part of wonderful children's lives. Uh, at, at my program, in order for us to be great teachers and grits here, we have to reconnect with ourselves. We have to know where we came from. We have to face our biases. And with thoughtful teachers and amazing inspiring peers, they're all here um, from all over the world, I was able to find at TC a space where I could feel safe, not only to find and look at, but to show my true colors. Um, dive in, be brave, and give a voice to those who, haven't, who have been left out. I was supported and was able to grow and develop courage to dive into my purpose and to embrace. Um, and here, that courage was, was valued. I, I wish every person in this room and every person in the world had this feeling of being, having incredible people believing in you and respecting you and attentive listening to what you have to say. Every educator needs that. Every educator needs that to support in order to be able to have courage to face all of the changes and the hardships and everything that we in a classroom meet. We meet stories, we meet different lives. And we need courage. We need courage to pick up fights. We need courage to be there. We need courage to share stories. And sometimes when we don't get that as teachers, we are not able to face our fears and to move on and lead our students through very wavy and rocky waters of growing up and learning. And there is a risk if we don't get that, if, we don't, if we're not able to reach out and, and talk to our teachers, and the risk is that we move backwards. And we've seen that again and again. And currently, this, this is what I, I wish I could share with everyone, is that courage is, it's the courage that helps me continue to try and innovate, as you, you know, she said probably 15 different things. 
I look like a crazy person going everywhere. But the truth is, I don't think the solution is only in one place. I think the solution is within ourselves, and there are many ways of getting there. And focusing on social and emotional learning is the way I thought. I've, I've been working with government programs. I've been working with publishers, with teacher trainings, and at my own experimental school. And I wish everyone could have that. So like David said, you know, we're picking up the challenge, getting an early career award, and having the privilege of listening to all of you. Um, I, I accept that challenge as well. I would like to thank my teachers, my family, my friends, my two wonderful kids, Anna Carolina and Spike, who are not here, but do teach me every day. Um, and I would like to thank these walls. I think if you've known me, you've seen me hugging walls. It's not weird. <laughs> I just <laughs> really would like to thank this institution for igniting the spark of social change, of meaning and respect to all areas of my life. I wish and I hope and I will continue to try to make a difference in this world. So thank you very much for honoring me. Let's have one more round of applause for all of our award recipients today. Thank you for joining us for this very special occasion. We look forward to receiving your future nominations to help us in identifying the next group of alumni who will join the ranks of these distinguished alumni. It will not be an easy feat to match the caliber of alumni we've seen today, but we know so many TC alumni are out there making an impact all across the world.